out there, you guys. So how do you feel about cannibalism? So this is my Tomes of Terror show where I talk about books, review horror books, and thrillers too sometimes. Now this book, if you guys have been watching some of my past videos, um, and I did a video that was my uh, 2021 TBR, and I showed you like the contents of my big huge book pile, and um, you know, just to kind of give you a heads up about what I'm gonna be reviewing in the upcoming year. Now, you may note that this book was actually not on there. What ended up happening with this was that every time I went on Amazon to order something, Amazon was like, man, you need to read this book. It kept like putting in my recommendations. And then it turned out too that a lot of book review channels that I read had picked this as one of their favorite books of 2020 and, you know, just couldn't stop recommending it. And also I have to admit, I was very drawn in by a lot of them saying it was one of the most fucked up things they had ever read, which to me, I'm like, oh. I'm intrigued. And also I will say that any book that if you go on Goodreads and it has a five star review and then underneath it, the only text of the review says, Jesus Christ, I'm on board with that. I wanna see what the hell the shit is all about. So I finally caved into Amazon and I said, okay, fine, send me a copy of the book and let's see what this is all about. So this is the probably infamous at this point, Tender is the Flesh by Agustina Basterica. Now, evidently, uh, this author is Argentinian, and I believe this is her second novel. She won a shit ton of awards for it. I think this originally came out in Argentina in 2017, but the English translation, which was done by Sarah Moses, um, actually came out last year, like in early 2020. I think most of the reviews I saw were from like February or something. So it must've come out um, around then. You know how when I was reviewing Kin by Keelan Patrick Burke and I was just kind of like, you know, all the content warnings. Okay, um, that for this book too, but times 100. <laughs> You know what I mean? If you are bothered by, let's see, what, what all's in here? It's like I said, this is a book that's entirely about cannibalism, industrialized cannibalism. There, you know, there is, so there's cannibalism, there's rape, there's horrible animal cruelty, there's just violence, there's just all kind of, it's just a shocking, really, really graphic, really, really detailed book. So if any of that is going to bother you, um, and I will say too that I'm still a meat eater, but if you're a vegetarian and you read this, this might validate your life choices. And I have seen some people that are meat eaters that have read this and are like, I don't know if I am gonna eat meat if for a few days at least, just because this book is like really disturbing. And uh, yeah, so let's kind of get into it. And like I said before, I will probably spoil some plot points. I don't know. Mm. And like I said, this is kind of like one of my one of my things where it's like I never really know if I'm going to spoil the ending until I actually get to that point when I'm talking about it. Because this has a really a gut punch of an ending. And I don't know if I want to spoil it. We'll find, we'll find out when I get there. But I'm just saying that this is there's going to be plot points that I'm going to spoil. So if you don't want to know anything about this book and you just want to go into it blind, obviously, then go read the book and then come back because I'm going to have like some kind of discussion about it, about its themes and stuff. And, you know, there might be some plot things that are spoiled for you that you might not want to be, even if I don't necessarily tell you what happens at the end, which I may when I get there, but we'll see. So I think that the closest equivalence to this book, I guess. It's a fable. It's a dystopia. It reminded me, it's very Orwellian. It reminded me, you know, of 1984, Animal Farm, a little bit like The Road, because this shit is fucking grim. This book is grim. There is no humor in it. I mean, it's just unrelenting horror and tragedy and sadness. So like I said, it's it's just a horrific, horrific read. That said, it's like, I still found it really compelling though, even though you're reading it and you're just like, oh my God, it just makes me wanna kill myself. But not, but in a entertaining way. I know that's like a really weird thing to say, but if you've read it, you might know what I'm talking about. Also, I've seen it compared to, or it has like similar themes to uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Now, some people, and I can't really speak to this, but some people have said there was a book that came out. I don't remember when it came out, but it was called Meat. And it was by somebody named Joseph DeLacy. And a few people have come forward and said that this book is 
I don't know, like a ripoff of that or a similar kind of theme. I don't know because I haven't read that. I'm just saying that that's what some people have said. But this is very much in an Orwellian type of vein where it posits, and, and like I said, it's kind of like a, like a fable in the sense that the shit that happens is realistic, as in there's nothing supernatural or anything, but it's exaggerated a little bit to make a point. Because the thing about it is that like some of the stuff that happens in here, it might not happen like that in real life. Like if a situation arose as arose as arises in this book, but it's all in the service of getting its message across and making the point that it's trying to make. Because I saw like a few people that criticized it on Goodreads. It seemed like a lot of their criticism was, well, this wouldn't happen. Like if, if a situation like this arose in real life, this is not how shit would go down. And I'm kind of like, well, maybe not, but that's not really the point that she's trying to make with this book. That'd be like telling George Orwell, man, farm animals don't talk. What the fuck? You know what I mean? It, it's a fable is what it is. And it's satirical to an extent. I don't know if I'd call it satirical just because it's not funny, like not even in a black humor sort of way. Like I said, it's just really, really grim. It's just unrelenting grimness. I don't want to say it's wallowing in like the worst that humanity does, but it's just making a point about, well, I'll kind of get into like what the themes are. So here's the setup for this book. This takes place in either a near future, a dystopian near future, or possibly an alternate future. It doesn't really matter. And I'm guessing that this is Argentina because of, there's a, just a few place names and stuff that are mentioned. It's not really, again, the um, location is not really that important because this is more like a fable. Now, what has happened is that sometime in the very recent history, as in so recent that the guy, you know, the protagonist of the book can still remember what things were like before, or at least it was either in his generation or his father's generation, you know, before things all went to hell. So it wasn't that long ago. So there was an epidemic, like a virus that broke out. I sent, I kind of pictured it sort of like super rabies or something like that. But like I said, the details of it are not important. That kind of spread to all the animals and made the animal meat no longer uh, safe for consumption by humans. And it came to pass too that everyone got so flipped out about the animals spreading the virus to the humans that animals were essentially wiped out. And even every idea of them has been wiped out. It's even illegal nowadays to have like pictures of animals or because there's one point where like the guy who is the main protagonist, um, he had like a son that had a little cot and it had, I think like a little bear or a little ducky or something like that on it. And he's not allowed to have that because they just want all mention of animals and, you know, all idea of animals to be eradicated. So there's that whole thing. So what ended up happening is that since people were still so hung up on eating meat, the government came in and did a thing called, and it was like the transition. I don't really know how long it took. And it was like I said, again, the details don't really matter. It's not like a world building type of book. It's just more like a fable or like a dark fairy tale type of story that's set in the real world. But, you know, with details, like I said, it's the greater themes that matter, not really the little details. So the government came in, there was this period called the transition where they're basically like, well, if you guys still want meat and we can't eat animals anymore. All the animals have been wiped out. So what we're going to do is we're going to start farming humans for consumption. So that is essentially what they start doing. So you're already getting a sense of this sort of stratified society where you have the people at the top um, and not even just rich people either. It's kind of middle class and up or whatever. And they're operating within the system where humans are bred and slaughtered just the way animals are nowadays. There's a whole system to it. So the protagonist of this book is named Marcos Tejo, and he is a manager at a processing plant. And it is a human meat processing plant. And it's set up pretty much just like an animal processing plant would be nowadays. 
the first half, this book is in two parts. So in the first half of the book, you kind of get um, a sense of, it's not so much like a day in the life, but it's kind of like you're following Marcos around on his job because he's a manager for this processing plant, which is one of the best regarded ones. Like they have the best meat or whatever, even though they don't call it that, but I'll get into that in a minute. So you get to see him going around to these different situations because his whole job is to go around to various places, you know, and pick up people's orders and figure out what kind of humans they want, like for whatever their purposes are. It's a really good way to introduce this world because this is this guy's job. He has to go around to all these different places, whether it's butcher shops or game preserves or something like that, anywhere that would order meat. And he has to go around and so you get to see different aspects of the society and how this legalized and industrialized cannibalism has affected society as a whole. And you get to see like all different aspects of that through his job and through his rounds. Now, while you're doing that, where he's kind of just going through his work week or whatever, you also get a little bit of a backstory as to what's going on in his personal life. Now, his personal life, not doing so great. Uh, His wife, Cecilia, has left him possibly temporarily. It's just that they had a son. They were really, really trying very hard to conceive. And like they had, I think they had had IVF and all that. And um, it took them a really long time to have a baby because they really wanted to have one. And then they finally had one and they were really happy. And then their baby died. It was like a crib death. So, you know, there was no one to blame. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't anything like that. So he's really, really having a hard time processing the fact that he wanted this son so badly and now he's gone. And his wife is also really having a hard time with it. And she has gone to stay with her mother because she just can't stand being in the house. She can't stand being around him because it's, you know, it reminds her and whatnot. So he's got all that going on. And also his dad, who he is very close to, and his dad actually worked in a slaughterhouse back in the old days before the transition when everyone could still eat animals. So Marcos has been in this line of work, you know, this is like the second generation, I believe, and maybe his grandfather was even in it too, but now he just made the transition to slaughtering humans instead of slaughtering animals. So his dad, who he was very close to, has dementia and he's in a home and he's really not doing very well. He's having episodes and so forth. And so Marcos is kind of conflicted because he hates his job and he sees that it's barbaric, but he needs the money to keep his dad, you know, at this place. So it's almost kind of like, well, he's trying to keep his head down and, you know, try to do what he has to do just to earn money, just to get by. So you have all this going on. And like I said, you know, the first half of the book is basically him going through the motions, going through his life. You get a little bit of backstory about him. You get, but I think like the main part of it is the descriptions of his day-to-day life and how, how this industrialized cannibalism has changed society. And in a sense, it has taken away people's empathy. It's really interesting because I could see some people saying that this book is essentially a polemic or is like against factory farming, which it definitely is because there's a very long and very, very detailed and very revolting and disgusting sequence where he is giving two potential employees a tour of the plant. So you go through the whole entire slaughtering process and it is very, very vividly described. And you can say, oh, that's like stomach churning, that's gross and everything, but it's the same thing that that we do to animals if you eat meat. So just the fact of, of them making it a human, it just shows, I guess it shows how much distance we have away from it because when it's done to animals instead of humans. So when it's done to humans, it becomes really shocking and really disgusting. So that's definitely one of the points that she's trying to make is that not necessarily, oh, we should all be vegetarians because I don't think that's what she's saying. I think that she's saying, she's trying to point out kind of, I guess, the hypocrisy 
of being disgusted by this stuff when it's done to a human when we're not necessarily as disgusted by it when it's done to an animal and and potentially like not even because obviously if you saw something like that that done to a pet which there's kind of a scene like that later on in here too so like i said trigger warning for animal cruelty because even i had a hard time with that one it's like some of the cutting up meat like human meat and stuff i was just kind of like yeah it's pretty gross but you know but then when it got to that one scene i was kind of like Oh, I had like, it's this really horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. But yeah, she was just kind of pointing out like the hypocrisy of, you know, we have pets or we have empathy for other humans. But now that society has become so stratified, what they've done is that they've taken essentially, it's not even an underclass because that's like a whole different thing, which I'll mention in a minute. But they're farming, they're just breeding people. And their whole purpose is they're going to go to the slaughterhouse and they're going to be slaughtered for meat and other people are going to eat them. They don't even call them humans, though. They call them head as though they're head of cattle. Like, you know, we got this many head today, like came in on the truck. And it's all kind of in the service of dehuman further dehumanizing these humans just so other people can feel better about eating human meat and making themselves feel like they're not eating other humans. You know what I'm saying? So the humans that are bred for meat are obviously uh, treated in horrific ways. They are, their vocal cords are cut out so that when they are slaughtered, they don't scream, uh, which is another thing that makes all the people that work in the factory, like, so they don't have to listen, you know, to, you know, or face the consequences of what they're doing. They're killing another human being. They have brands all over them. Um, The pregnant women, uh, their limbs are removed when they get pregnant so that they're not so that they can't harm the baby because, you know, that's a very important commodity. And obviously baby meat is also kind of a big delicacy, too, because, you knew they were going there. So they, they don't want anything that's going to mess up their investment, which is human meat. And I should it should be noted, too, that every part and he kind of goes into this when he's giving the tour to the employees that every part of the human is used. They use their skin to make leather, you know, because I'm in this world, there's really no animals anymore. Um, You know, there's still birds and shit, but it's like, you know, big land animals. There's no more of those. So they, um, you know, they use their skin for leather. They use their urine for various things. They use their blood for things. Although I don't remember if they ever said specifically, but mm, yeah. So there's a part in it where somebody says, well, what do you use the blood for? And he's like, oh, we use that for other purposes, but I don't think they ever like specify what it is. And uh, there's also a trade in some of these humans that are bred for slaughter are also experimented on because as I said, we no longer have animals to experiment on. So then now they just experiment on humans. So one of the really interesting things that this book does, and I think one of the main, I don't even know if I'd call this a subtext because I think one character even says something like this. And, you know, it's even kind of brought up in the first paragraph of the book is that the way we frame things, the language that we use to describe things makes it easier for us to deal with atrocities that we do. You know what I mean? Because I think the whole point of this book, here's the really interesting thing. And as I said, I don't know because I haven't read it in the original Spanish, obviously. I just read the translation. But from what I can determine, the translation of it is actually very good. The style of the book is very direct. It's very brutal. It's very matter of fact. And she wrote it in that way because she wanted to illustrate how the language that we use can normalize something, even something as horrific as people being raised as essentially cattle for the slaughter. So one of the subtexts of the book, as I said, one of the themes of the book is that it's very easy to normalize horrors when you're not referring to them as what they really are. So in that context, in this world, you're not allowed to use the word cannibalism. You're not allowed to call it human meat. It's called special meat. Um, You're not allowed to refer to these people as humans at all. You have to call them head or product or merchandise or something like that. You can't refer to them as humans because 
the you know the government the corporates the pa- the corporations the powers that be don't want you to see them as humans they want you to see them as just like breed animals for your consumption so that's basically another big point that she was making and another interesting thing and i didn't really realize this while i was reading and i think i realized it like the next day like after i finished reading it is that even though the the main bulk of the book, which, as I said, it's, it's told from his point of view, but not in the first person. You know, the sentences are just very short, very direct. It's not real. It's descriptive, but not flowery. The only time that she uses metaphorical language is when she's talking about someone's words or their voice or something like that. For example, you have the beginning of the book, which is basically just carcass, cut in half, stunner, slaughter line, spray wash. It's just kind of like that. The whole thing isn't like that real staccato, but it's just this very brutalist, very straightforward way of talk of, uh, you know, getting the ideas across. But when she's talking about someone's words, she uses metaphors like uh, his sister's words are like boxes filled with blank paper, things like that. So you know, or someone's words are black holes or something. That's the only time that she ever uses metaphor, really, because that's one of the main themes of the book is that language forms thought. And if you can be convinced to feel okay about something, then things can get super horrific and it'll be okay because you're justifying it by your use of language and euphemism. And I think that's like a really big theme of this book. Now, when we get to the second part, because as I said, the first is almost kind of like, you know, a tour of this world as it is, even though it doesn't come across like that. It just comes across like this guy who's having kind of this shitty time. You get the sense that it just like in a lot of Orwell's books, like a lot of his protagonists where they're unhappy with this world and they're kind of, you know, trying to maneuver their way through it. But you feel like at some point they might break free and just be like, you know, fuck all this or whatever. That's not exactly what happens in this, though. Just saying. But yeah, so so it's just this tour of of what the world is like kind of seen through this guy's eyes who has become very desensitized, very dehumanized in this world. But he's not happy about it, uh, particularly because of all his all of his personal faults. Now, right about the halfway point of the book, as I said, this is in two parts. He receives, or a little bit before the halfway point, I guess, he receives a gift in the form of a head, a woman who, well, they can't call it that, who has been bred for meat. And she is what they call an FGP, first generation pure. Now, a lot of the meat that they make, just like they do with animals, um, is genetically modified and they're given hormones to grow faster and all that kind of stuff. However, if you get one that was actually naturally birthed, that's a very, very valuable commodity. Because essentially, it's like organic. I guess it'd be like organic meat because it's just like this was a woman that was raised like a normal person and fattened with regular things and wasn't given all of these hormones and whatnot. So he receives her as a gift from a client. And as I said, she's first generation pure. So she's really, really valuable. But he reacts the way he's like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? It's like, well, now do I have to slaughter her? I'll have to take somewhere, take her to somewhere else, like the butcher shop to slaughter her. I could sell her. I could do this, that, and the other thing. He doesn't really think of her like a person because he's been conditioned to think of meat the same way we would think of like, you know, cattle that we're going to slaughter or whatever. So he basically just, he's like, man, it just seemed like too much trouble. And so he just kind of ties her up in the barn and like, you know, throws her some water and feed every now and then and and all that kind of stuff. But as the second part of the book goes on, you get the sense that he's starting to see her almost like a person. Now, obviously, she can't talk. Uh, She's completely uneducated. She has she has no idea what's going on. Um, She's as I said, she's been bred to be slaughtered. So she's you know, I I imagine she has some kind of rudimentary human intelligence, but she hasn't been taught anything or anything like that. So, uh, you know, kind of all she knows is fear and just reacting to things. So he keeps her in the barn for a while, but since his wife has been gone and he's been so upset, uh, you know, about his son dying and then his father ends up dying. And he's kind of, as I said, you kind of get a sense that 
he misses the world the way it was. There's there's kind of a running thread where he keeps going back to this zoo, which obviously is closed now because all the animals are dead. But he used to go there with his dad when he was a kid. And he used to remember like all the beautiful birds and the aviary and the monkeys and everything. And you get the sense that he wants to go back to that world. So you do get a sense that he does some have some humanity remaining. And his relationship with this woman, who he actually ends up giving a name, Jasmine, because that's kind of what her smell reminds him of. So you think that he's kind of going toward that, that he's, you know, his humanity is still in there, you know, because there's a, there's a scene, there's scenes with her, there's a, a horrifying scene where, well, it's two scenes, actually. The first scene where he finds a bunch of puppies in the zoo, because not all the animals are dead, but it's just, you know, they're, they've been trying to, you know, eradicate them because of the virus. And they're afraid that the virus will spread to humans and blah, blah, blah. So they're, but there's still, you know, wild dogs running around every now and then, but not really. And everyone's like terrified of them. So there's a scene with some puppies and then like some really horrible shit happens to the puppies later on. So yeah, that was, that was really upsetting. You get the sense that he still has a humanity in there, that he hasn't been, that it hasn't all been crushed out of him by the way that the world is. But it's interesting because the way this ends, I don't think I'm going to spoil the ending outright, but I'm just going to say it's, it doesn't go maybe the way you think it's going to go. It goes in a more, maybe like a 1984, a brave new world type of direction. And at first when I read the end, I was just like, holy fucking shit, man. Like I felt like somebody had punched me in the stomach and because I didn't expect it. But the more I thought about the book and a lot of the imagery in it, that's where it was heading the whole entire time. I guess I just didn't really see it because there are a bunch of, he has like a couple of really vivid dreams a couple of times and the imagery that's portrayed in that dream, like now that I'm thinking about it, I was like, oh, that's what that was saying. That he wasn't actually, even though he still had these little tendrils of humanity and the way that he treated Jasmine because... He, en he actually ends up getting her pregnant. Now, I should say that this is really, really illegal. This is one of the ironic things about this world that is created in this book is that humans are bred for meat. However, slavery is still considered barbaric and you are not allowed to have sex with the head, you know, the 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 humans that are bred for slaughter it's it's really really taboo it's really really illegal if they catch you doing it they will send you and the head to the slaughterhouse so you will get slaughtered also um however he does actually end up having sex with uh with her and getting her pregnant it's almost kind of like the second part of the book like i said it almost kind of leads you down this primrose path it's like you know oh everything's gonna be okay she's gonna have a baby he's gonna fight the system and you know, I was, you know, I have a baby with this woman who's just considered like a like cattle, you know, and he's just going to like run off and they're going to be happy somewhere. And like I said, spoiler alert, that does not happen, which I guess in a way is a more realistic kind of ending. I should note, too, though, that even though it's technically illegal to have sex with the meat humans, obviously, just like in the real world, uh, if you're rich, you can get away with pretty much anything. So there are and actually he does go and visit a game preserve where basically if you have a lot of money, you can go and hunt humans. And then if you kill one, then they will prepare it. Like it's a big country club type situation and they'll prepare it for you all nice and fancy. And you can sit there and eat it. You can have whatever piece you want and all this other stuff. And then when he's there, the one guy that runs the game preserve, who seems like this very like European kind of uh, aristocratic type of dude. And he says, well, you know, there are other places. It was not this place, but there are some other kind of underground places where you can have sex with the with the meat humans as much as you want. And then, you know, to even though for everyone else, it's illegal. I should mention too, because I, I think I forgot to mention this before. There's also, I know I said earlier that there's not a lot of world building in this, but now that I'm thinking about it, now that I'm kind of trying to go back over all the little details that she kind of fills in about this, I'm like, oh, maybe it is kind of like a big world, but you know, I don't know. I guess it didn't occur to me because it was very organic the way it came out. But so you also have a group of people called the scavengers 
who are kind of like, you know, the, the lower classes or untouchables, if you want to call them that. So these are basically just bands of poor people who are starving and they will go and get, if you, okay, so there's a curfew. So if you go out after curfew, then basically you are fair game. If you get eaten by the scavengers, then that's your own goddamn fault because you were out after dark or whatever. They also, there's also a thing now where you can't really have funerals anymore. You just have to, you know, if your loved one dies and you don't want them to get eaten, then you have to go immediately to the crematorium and they put the body in a clear casket and put it in the crematorium so you can see that they got burned and then you have to sign the thing that says it got burned you know they nobody got it or whatever so there are scavengers and they um basically some of the bigger plants including the one that marcos works at will kind of throw them like if there's like some shitty meat that you know got damaged in transit or it was dead when it got there or something like that they'll throw it out to the scavengers other meat that gets thrown out to the scavengers is this isn't gone a huge amount into, but there's a little bit about this where there's this religious sect that has sprung up. I think they're called the church of the immolation. And they have a weird thing where they think that your life is not valuable unless it has gone to feed another person that needs it. So the members of this sect periodically will come to, they, they all kind of, um, someone agrees to be a sacrifice. And so they will all come to the plant and um, they, they will give themselves up as a sacrifice. And um, they, you know, because they think it's this big thing that they're doing for the world. And they do this, they have this kind of agreement with the plants to do that so they can keep their tax exempt status, I think is what it was. So that's come as kind of a weird, like Judeo Christian kind of eat of my body flesh kind of thing. So it's like people taking it literally. But those people that sacrifice themselves, the religious people, they are also fed to the scavengers because they, it's seen as inferior meat because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't farmed. It wasn't raised properly. You know, it didn't have all of the things that they like their meat to go into because they have a reputation to uphold. So as I said, this book is essentially, the theme of it is humanity, as monstrous as humanity can be, we can almost justify anything if we couch it in the correct terms. I kind of feel like that is where she was going with that. Because as I said, people are just perfectly willing to turn a blind eye that fellow humans are being butchered and served up as meat as long as we don't call it that, as long as we call it other things. They can't, like I said, they can't even call it human meat. They call it special meat. Even all the pieces that they sell in the butcher shop. Cause there's also this woman named Spinel that he visits at a butcher shop and you know, they they'll cut off the hands and sell the cans, but it's called like upper extremity. They can't even call it like, Hey, it's a human hand because people don't want to know that that's what they're eating. So that's kind of the overarching theme of the book is that this monstrousness, people are okay with it because you know, they're getting something they want. They're getting meat. They're having a quote unquote sort of normal life, which is all they want. And as long as they don't have to think about it, then they're fine with it. So it's almost kind of like complacency. And another thing, another theme too, is how easy it is to undermine people's empathy for others. Um, as I said, especially when you're couching it in this particular language, um, because, you know, obviously the people that they're slaughtering for me, they don't see them as people. They just see them the way we would see a pig or a cow. So that's another thing too. It's very much class stratification, all that kind of stuff. And like I said, this is very Orwellian and you know, the grim tone of it kind of reminded me of the road a little bit too. Uh, I've seen some people compare it to Soylent Green, which it is kind of like that as well. I will say this is, I can see why so many people said this is one of the most fucked up things they ever read because, and I think the thing that makes it fucked up, I mean, yes, it is very graphic and yes, the detail is very, I mean, it is just intimate details of going, I mean, picture going through a slaughterhouse and just like imagining because that's exactly what happens. So she just like very matter of factly like lays out, this is what we do in this room and this is what we do. And she's like just describing it. It's not over the top. It's not, it's just very, very direct, just very laid it all out there. And that's what it's like. And she, so she's trying to just get you to look at it, you know, without any flowery language, without any euphemistic language, that's just, what it's like and 
kind of asking the question, are we okay with that? You know what I'm saying? But the thing about it, I think that's what makes it more fucked up. The way that it's written, it's just kind of, and I've seen some people mention this too, when they were talking about reading the book, they said, as I went through the book, you know, it, as horrific as a lot of the shit that happens and it is, it almost becomes normalized. And I think that's exactly what she was trying to do. She was trying to show how easy it is for even something as horrifying as industrialized cannibalism and like some of the fucked up shit that happens in this book, how easy it is to just get numb to it by the way, you know, while you're going through the book. So I think she, it was like a masterful way of doing that, like using the language to kind of get her point across on top of the actual story and the actual things that happened in the story, which was also getting her point across. So it was like really, it was like a really good meeting of, you know, the way the language was used in service of the theme of the book. I think that was like really good because it did get to a point where horrific shit was happening and you just kind of like, yeah, you were just kind of, you got desensitized after a while. And I think that was kind of the point that she was making. So, and like I said, I think the ending of this was fucking great. It's a, it's a gut punch of an ending. Like I said, you're going to, I felt like, yeah, I felt like I'd been like socked in the jaw at the end. Cause I was like, what? <laughs> you know, because I guess I was expecting it. Like I said, I was expecting it to go, Hey, here's a, because so many of our books are kind of like just one guy fighting the system. And it was like, yeah, go guy. Um, and you kind of thought that this was going to go in that direction, but it really doesn't go in that direction. And then it shocks you, but then when you think about it and you think about all the stuff that happened back, you know, throughout the book and you think about all the imagery and all the dreams that he had and, you know, and then it makes complete sense. But when you're reading it, it just seems to like just fucking blindside you and come out of nowhere. But the more you think about it, you're like, oh, well, there's really no other way that that could have ended because, it, you know, given the context of the world that he lives in, what the fuck? was he actually going to do? I mean, it was just was like unrealistic, like thinking that he could just, you know, take on the whole system or whatever, which like I said, he really does not. So as I said, if you're not into real, real graphic shit, real, real grim shit, this is not a fun read, not by any stretch of the imagination. There is no humor. There is no nothing. It's just unrelenting bleakness and grimness. But that said, it's also really, really compelling. And the more you think about it, and you will think about it, the more its themes really kind of resonate. Because yes, it's exaggerated. Yes, it's unbelievable in the sense that, you know, if all the animals died, we couldn't eat animals anymore. I do, you know, especially like nowadays, I just feel like everyone would just go to meat substitutes because that's become like, you know, mainstream to an extent or everyone's used to the idea of it. And I think it would take a lot to get people to actually get on board with the idea of eating humans the way we would eat people. But that's the thing, you never know. And the way that it happened, I could, I don't know. It's it's not believable, like I said, but under certain circumstances, I could totally see it happening. But I think, like I said, the believability of it isn't, that. that's not the issue. That's not the point that she's trying to make. It's a fable. It's not supposed to be completely realistic. It's just, it's trying to show you an alternate reality to cast light on our actual reality. You know what I'm saying? But in that sense, it kind of reminded me of uh, that. I think it was a Spanish movie called The Platform, which was on Netflix. It kind of reminded me of that in the sense that, you know, obviously the the plot of it, the framework of it is not entirely believable. It's like, you know, where is this building? Where are these people? You know, who's up there? Like you know, who built this infrastructure with the platform coming down with all the food and stuff like that? That's not what's important. The whole point is that you were using fiction to, to make a point about our real life. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what this is. So if you like really fucked up shit and you think this is not going to bother you. And like I said, content warning, cannibalism, animal cruelty, rape, all kinds of terrible, terrible things happened in this book. Probably, probably more terrible things happened in this book than any other book I've ever read. And probably a lot of books that I've read put together, but it is brilliant. And I can see how a lot of people, how it got all these uh, prizes and how it got, it's already been translated into nine languages. Definitely. If you really like fucked up shit and you really like dystopian kind of shit and you think you can stomach it. Cause if, if you think, yeah, this, this is not for weak stomached people at, at all. Um, you know, it's, it's gross and it's nasty and, uh, it'll, 
put you off your food for a little while. But yeah, Tender is the Flesh by Agustina Basterica. Fun fact, I think in the in uh, the native Spanish, I think it was actually called Exquisite Corpse, which, um, you know, is also a good title. And that, and that had like a little bit of a reference within the story of, you know, a couple of the, his, I think it's his niece and nephew was like a game they were playing. And uh, I think that's a real thing, isn't it? Like Exquisite Corpse, that's like some kind of poem or a game or something like that. So, uh, but yeah, they changed it to that because I guess they f- figured... Nobody would know what Exquisite Corpse was in this game. No, Poppy Z. Bright had a book called that, didn't she? Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so definitely if you like fucked up literature, then uh, give it a read and let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. And uh, I'll be back to do another book review next week. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.